my name is Jess, I'm 29 years old and it has been six years since I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Um, the background to this video is very much going to be the seagulls outside my window because they haven't shut up all day and I just want to record so, you know, sorry. <laughs> um, I thought what I'd do is I'd start by telling you a bit about what BPD is um, and then I'd talk to you about how I got diagnosed uh, what the diagnosis meant for me in terms of treatment and then sort of where I'm at now and how it has changed my life because it would not be an understatement to say that having a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder like changed my life in the most dramatic way. Welcome, stick around while I bare my soul in the hopes that um, somebody listening to this will be helped <laughs> by what I'm about to say. Um, the reason I do stuff like this is because like lots of the people who um, I speak to over on my Instagram, um, Worried Whip It and Human.Jess, um, are either people with BPD themselves or people who are parents of people with BPD. I think it's a really difficult diagnosis for people to understand and I just think the more we can talk about it, the more we can normalise it, the more we can destigmatize it because it's a really heavily stigmatised diagnosis the better it is. So um, yeah, here's just a little six year reflection from me on what it's meant to me to live with BPD. So to begin with, borderline personality disorder is the most commonly recognised personality disorder. Um, it basically affects your amygdala, your prefrontal cortex, and the way that you, that your brain experiences emotions. Um, and it impacts on your internal emotional life and it also therefore impacts on your relationships with other people and the way that you exist in the world. I'm going to read a bit from the NHS Choices website because I think it's really useful. It says the symptoms of BPD can be grouped into four main areas. Emotional instability, this is the psychological term for this is affective dysregulation but I guess this just means that your emotions <laughs> change a lot, are quite intense and like importantly for me and the way that I was experiencing it aren't always directly relatable to the experiences that you're having in the world. So something might happen and your emotional response might be, you know, quite detached from what actually happened. You know, sometimes you have surprising and very intense emotional reactions to things, is I think what I'm trying to say. Um, and it can be very difficult for you to, to regulate those feelings. So um, quite often people with borderline personality disorder um, will self-harm or engage in certain behaviours um, like uh, disordered eating, risky sex, crude ways that you learn, I guess, to try and keep those emotions in check. The next one is disturbed patterns of thinking or perception, cognitive distortions or perceptual distortions. Again, like something happens in the real world and your experience of it is very different. So um, you might think that people think certain things about you or um, jump to conclusions, make assumptions, etc. And then have a very intense emotional response to that. Impulsive behaviour, so that's things like the risky sex, the self-harming, um, drug and alcohol misuse. I've met people in my BPD journey who um, do a lot of like risky driving or just like put themselves in situations that are quite dangerous because you know it's helping them in some way to like manage their emotions. And the last one is intense but unstable relationships with others. So for lots of people BPD manifests really strongly in their romantic relationships. People with BPD can be quite difficult to be in a relationship with. They or we get like very strongly attached to perhaps one person and those relationships can be characterised by a fear of abandonment, a constant worry that you're going to leave us and uh, we're going to be on our own and in order to try and manage that quite often people with BPD will try and get the upper hand by pushing somebody away before um, they can reject you, I guess. All of these things, like lots of these are quite like stigmatised symptoms, I think, and um, some of them can feel very ugly when they're happening to you, you know, like um, the ways that you behave when you have this illness sometimes like don't feel great, um, like there are certain things that I look back on with a lot of shame but I also think that people with BPD can be some of the strongest, kindest, most empathetic people so I think we're cool. I was diagnosed with BPD when I was 24 and you are right. Yeah. Cool! And by this point I had been living like chaotically and in great difficulty for a decade, I want to say. 
the main or the most noticeable way for me that the BPD manifested was well, like the most notable symptoms I guess that I was experiencing were an eating disorder, a binge eating disorder, some restricting, mostly binging, but a chaotic eating disorder that was affecting everyone around me. Hi doggy. Um, but especially my family. I was having real crises at mealtimes. I had a control issue, so like if the meal wasn't ready when I was told it would be ready, then that was like major drama. Um, and I would binge and I would like binge right before a meal time, just out of like sheer panic. And I was like breaking plates, like throwing things. Um, yeah, really difficult. Um, and at the time my family were just like, you know, we were all just like, you know, Jess is just, just a bit of an angry person. Like it never occurred to us that there was something much deeper going on. Um, and the, yeah, the other way I guess that it manifested was, um, well, two other ways, alcohol misuse, like I was drinking a lot and I was really reliant on alcohol, um, which was making my life actually more chaotic, but like more emotionally manageable. Um, and anger, like I was really, my feelings really like happened to me. They would settle on me and it would be like a cloud of rage. And I was very confused a lot of the time. Like I didn't understand what I was feeling or why I was feeling it, but like I was not in control of how I was expressing those feelings. Um, and that was really obviously, obviously you can imagine that is very, very difficult. Um, I guess some of you might, might be watching this because you know somebody or love somebody with BPD and that might be familiar to you. Um, I know from like looking back at how my family found it, it was like a very intensely difficult thing for them and you know that's hard to look back on but um we're in a much better place now i had been in treatment for not in treatment i'd been seeing a, a therapist about my binge eating disorder um i've been through a bunch of therapists some of them good ish some of them bad most of them cbt therapists and actually the reason that the cbt wasn't working was because the eating disorder was just like really a symptom of my BPD. Um, anyway, so I had like a chaotic relationship with therapy already and it just became apparent that I needed something more robust. And so somehow I ended up, my, I was really lucky in that my parents had health insurance and I ended up at the Priory in North London to see a psychiatrist who was going to do me an assessment and then funnel me into the right type of therapy for whatever I was experiencing. So I went in there fully expecting him to tell me that I had an eating disorder and to be like, oh. But yes, that's not what happened. He basically sat me down and asked me a whole string of questions and the outcome was <laughs> that I was referred into DBT, which is Dialectical Behavioural Therapy, and I was given this borderline personality diagnosis. And the first thing I did was like go online and look it up, what is BPD, because I had, I think I'd heard of it, I'd seen Girl Interrupted. <laughs> um, that was probably my only exposure to it, really. Which is not helpful, like, when, you know, your first exposure to your own diagnosis is sort of um, unrealistic and stigmatising. But anyway, so yeah, I went online, read through these symptoms and, like, really, really saw... It really painted a picture of me and my emotional life and the kind of chaos and turbulence that I had been living in. Um, and I don't know if you've had that feeling before, like, maybe you have, like, if you've had any kind of diagnosis, like physical, mental, anything, like the the relief of seeing it written down somewhere, you can suddenly imagine being listened to and believed and understood, like that's a very powerful thing. And also like maybe a path into treatment and that gives you hope and could be the start of change. And that for me was also an incredibly powerful thing. So like that moment, just that moment of diagnosis, I think, was totally overwhelming, totally liberating, anxiety inducing, confusing for sure, like not all positive, but um, powerful, definitely really powerful. And then the best thing about getting a diagnosis for me was um, they basically put me on this treatment plan. Um, they put me in dialectical behavioral therapy, which I will tell you all about in a minute. Yeah, it basically opened this door for me that had not been opened before. And it, it was, somebody was saying to me like, we have this really effective treatment <laughs> that is gonna be able to help you. That felt really major for me. 
DBT is not the only way to treat borderline personality disorder. Um, it is a very effective way of treating borderline personality disorder. I have not got experience of any other treatments, so I'm just going to tell you about like what I went through and um, how it was for me. Um, but obviously these things are different for, for everyone and um, I'm not a professional, I'm just a person speaking from my experience, so you know, don't at me in the comments. But DBT. So Basically, I went in one day a week to the Priory and in the morning I had group therapy with a group of other people and in the afternoon I had one-on-one -on -one therapy with a therapist. And DBT is basically, yeah, it stands for Dialectical Behavioural Therapy and it's sort of, it's modular, it's broken down into four modules. Um, and I always think the thing about DBT is like, it would help anyone, like we should all, <laughs> everyone should have DBT, like it's, a, it's just an education in your feelings, like... The therapy was structured like being in a classroom, like we would sit down, there was a whiteboard, we'd take notes. And I just the whole way through was thinking to myself like, why, why didn't I learn this at school? How much easier would my life have been if I learned this at school? Um, so the modules are mindfulness. I know that for lots of people, like there's a lot of skepticism about mindfulness and there definitely was for me. Basically the idea behind the mindfulness is that when you, have BPD, I think anyone can recognise this, but like when you have BPD, your emotions just kind of come down and settle on you. They happen to you. Like you don't feel like you have agency over your feelings. And mindfulness basically <laughs> gives you the opportunity to when your feelings are happening to you, to be able to observe them, label them, be like, I am feeling angry, or perhaps I am feeling angry because, um, and then you can intervene. There is no way for you to intervene when you can't even see or acknowledge or get any visibility of your feelings. Um, so the mindfulness kind of almost has the ability to like take you out of a moment and give you a little bird's eye view. That was not a skill that I'd ever had before, not something I'd been able to do before um, and like totally radical. <laughs> the next thing that they teach you is uh, interpersonal skills, which is basically just like how to have relationships with other people, how to ask for things that you need, how to say no to people, um, and, and like maintain that relationship. They're just like the really fundamental building blocks of like how to communicate with people on an emotional level. And it's all kind of like, you know, it is classroom stuff, like it's acronyms. How to construct a sentence that is like protects you and your feelings and your wants and needs, but also isn't gonna hurt somebody else. I think like when you live with BPD, you get, you know, you don't want to hurt other people, but like quite often you do. And so being taught how to like have these conversations and navigate these relationships without being like, not without feeling like a sort of ticking time bomb, like that was pretty cool. The next thing they teach you is emotional regulation. Again, like, why don't you learn this as a kid? Emotional regulation was like, if you are starting to feel a certain feeling, you're not in crisis yet, but you know, like the feelings are beginning to happen to you. Um, how can you manage those feelings? Things like, I mean, <laughs> things that allow I'm like, oh, but like you just wouldn't have occurred to me. Things like going for a walk or doing some exercise, but also like listening to some nice music or um, phoning a friend or watching a bit of TV, perhaps some just like, perhaps just distracting yourself for a bit. It wasn't something that I'd learned that I'd been able previously to do for myself really without resorting to things like alcohol or self-harm or risky sex or whatever it was that was you know making me that, that that was like keeping a lid on me somehow and it also wasn't something that I'd had the opportunity to do because you know as I've described it things were just happening to me I wasn't in the driving seat therefore um you know, I wasn't making decisions about the things that I was doing, really. That's not me making excuses for the ways that I behaved. Like, I totally take responsibility and ownership for things. Um, but I just mean that sort of in the, the way that my brain was working and racing and protecting me, like, that's what your brain is doing when you have BPD. It's often a response to trauma. And your brain goes into autopilot to protect you from things. And the ways that it does that are sometimes destructive. The fourth thing that you learn in DBT is, I can't remember what they call it, but it's basically like what to do in an emotional crisis. So this is like when you're beyond going for a walk or phoning a friend. It's when you're about to do something dangerous like self-harm or 
uh, whatever behaviour it is that you engage in that is harmful to you. They're all kind of self-harming behaviours, I guess. Things that can just give you relief in that moment of intensity, like having a really cold shower. We learnt techniques that would stop you from self-harming, like sort of pinging a rubber band on you and stuff that were like, um, you know, that weren't going to do you any lasting damage, but that might try and relieve some of those really intense feelings. So, yeah, we did this in a group setting. Group therapy is just intense, really intense, but um, I kind of loved it like we got quite close as a group and I met some really really extraordinary people who were going through some really really difficult times and it was a privilege to like be there in the trenches with people as we tried to do this extraordinary thing which is like healing from a very intense psychological trauma and behavioural pattern. For me, I just came out of it a completely different person. And I know that this won't be the same for everyone. You know, there were people who found it hard and dropped out. Maybe it wasn't for them. Maybe they weren't in the right place. Um, there were people who went round multiple times and did it again. I kept seeing my therapist for years afterwards, one-on-one, -on -one, like having weekly sessions or ad hoc sessions. Um, but by the time I came out of that therapy, I felt like I had just broken a cycle. Just the big thing for me was like, was being able to see the patterns that I'd been stuck in and understand them and just feel like I was in the driving seat again in my life. I'd really lost that feeling of control and agency and having that back was empowering and gave me hope. And the thing that happened was that my relationships began to change like a lot. Um, and I was able to heal relationships that needed healing. I was able to see relationships that weren't serving me and let them go. Um, I was able to remove myself from situations that were like triggering or dangerous for me. And yeah, it's just been a different life. So here I am now, six years later. I still have therapy sometimes on and off. Um, I don't meet the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder anymore. There are still some things I live with, but like I don't live with like sort of active BPD. I'm free from like my, I'm free from, I don't think that's the right word, but like, you know, I don't live in my problem behaviors. I'm not using my problem behaviors. I'm not relying on like harmful things to manage my feelings anymore. Um, and I think what happened was, like, those skills that I was writing down in textbooks and stuff, I used them and used them and used them and used them every single day. I picked my favourite ones, I practised and practised and practised, <laughs> and I was, like, really deliberately and methodically putting those skills into use in my life. And then there came a point, I don't know how long later, where I realised that I wasn't using them in that methodical way anymore, but I just absorbed them as part of like who I was and my strategies for coping in the world um, and they'd sort of become second nature and every now and again I'll go back to them I'll go back to my DBT textbook or I'll go back to my I don't know yeah my notes or I'll watch a YouTube video or I'll listen to some I don't know um, oh Dr Julie's book really really good got to plug that right now there's a lot of DBT in there and I found it really useful I'll stick a something here so you can have a look and I'll pop it in the comments as well but anyway um, yeah, every now and again I go back to my skills and my techniques and stuff, but generally speaking, like, I don't need them in the same way anymore because I'm not experiencing things in the same way anymore. Yeah, like, these days when I experience emotions, they're just emotions. It's not like my world changes, it's not like I see red, it's not like the most excruciating pain and nothing will ever be okay again. I can sort of like roll with my feelings I bounce back really quickly I didn't used to bounce back like something bad would happen or I would experience something badly and you know it took me a long time to get back on my feet again um whereas these days like I can have a cry in the afternoon and a laugh in the evening and I'm not like plunged into the depths of something every time I hit a bump in the road and my relationships are just so much improved um, I have a really great relationship with Ollie, we're getting married and our relationship feels really calm 
unstable, unhealthy. My relationships with my family are so much better. I don't shout anymore. I used to shout so much. I used to be so angry. But the thing that I look back on now, when I look back on those years where I was like really in the throats of BPD, um, what I think about is um, there's a lot of like shame and I try, I'm trying to work past that. And I do tend to dwell on like the difficult and the negative feelings that I have about it. Um, and I'm working on that as well. But like one of the things that I will always be grateful for and always try and keep in the front of my mind is that like when you're living with that kind of like raw emotion, you know, there's an awful lot of pain and an awful lot of anger and hurt and confusion but with the same intensity and the same, yeah, fierceness, like there's an enormous capacity for like love and kindness and generosity and all of those feelings, all of those like warm feelings, you feel with the same intensity and that is something really special, I think. It's a superpower. So if you have BPD or you love someone with BPD, just remind them about that superpower because I think it's something really special that we have. If this is something that you're going through at any point in this journey, A, like hang in there because it really does get better and B, I would love to hear from you. It's always nice to chat to people you share experiences with um, and you know, I'm quite open about these things. So do come and find me over on Instagram. I'm human.jess. Um, if you love dogs, you might love my dog. She's worried with it. Um, <laughs> do check her out as well. And yeah, let me know in the comments or give this a little like. These things are quite hard to make and a like goes a long way. Thanks for being here. Bye.